Welcome once again to our broadcast here from Minnesota Valley Free Lutheran Church in Lakeville, Minnesota. And I'm Pastor Tom Olson. I'm glad you've joined us today. Uh, Barnabas, our encouraging little dog, continues to be here to help with the children's sermons. And uh, today our topic we're looking at is, what is the right day to go to church? Is it Saturday? No. Is it Sunday? No. When is it? Oh, the best day time to go to church is the dog days of summer. Oh, yes, I knew you'd say something like that. Well, the Bible here in our ongoing study of Romans, yep, looking in the Bible at the book of Romans, uh, talks in Romans 14, verse 5, about what day we should go to church. And it says, one man considers one day more sacred than another, and another man considers every day alike. Each should be fully convinced in his own mind. Wow. Sounds to me like there's some liberty here. Uh, so you see, some people were used to going to their synagogue meetings on Saturday, and they preferred that day. Others preferred the first day of the week when Jesus rose from the dead. And then the Bible says, in another spot, they met every day from house to house. And some would like to study the Word of God and have fellowship every day. But be convinced in your own mind. Um, I wanted to start a special church service here for those who um, have health problems or work in the healthcare industry and have to have stricter rules. And I was going to start it on Saturday, and someone said, oh, no, please have it on Sunday, because that's the day that... I feel best going to church. So I said, oh, okay, we'll do that. And then we moved our drive in to Saturday night, and that just even improved it all the more. So the Saturday night people prefer the drive in, and the health care workers prefer early on Sunday morning. But God is available all the time. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. And it doesn't matter when we meet to him just that we have peace in our hearts and come with a good spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you now that we can have peace in our hearts and come with a good spirit. Uh, summer, winter, any day of the week, the Word of God is living and active and the Holy Spirit is there. Welcome, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, Barnabas, why don't you go and rest a little bit again? And we are going to move on. To our topic for the day here from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 23, about liberty and responsibility. Um, Billy Graham grew up in a strict prohibitionist Baptist home where they weren't allowed to touch alcohol. And he was so surprised when he went and had a crusade in England and stayed in a Baptist home and they offered him an alcoholic beverage, wine or something. And he wasn't used to that because it was different in England than in America. And they have never heard there that a Christian shouldn't touch alcohol, but they had heard that you shouldn't get drunk. Um, I grew up in a home where a woman was allowed to wear jeans or slacks or a dress. But then I um, visited a home once where they said, well, no, Women are to wear men's clothes, and they must wear dresses at all times. And so that's the way that home was. Well, and then, of course, in the Old, New Testament times, everybody wore just kind of robes. So it wasn't dress versus slacks, but that's that home. And another home where they felt that you shouldn't eat seafood or shellfish or pork because they're forbidden as far as Old Testament Jewish ceremonial law goes, and they thought that that should go back into the New Testament time as well, and other people don't feel that way at all. Peter had an opportunity to have a vision where God changed that. Um, when I was young, back in the hippie days, in the late hippie days, uh, a real dedicated Christian boy would be clean cut and well shaven and wear a suit and tie. And the hippies just didn't cut their hair and and they had beards and wore funny clothes, bell bottoms. And, and then I went to an Amish area where the Amish guys didn't cut their hair very much 
and it was kind of frumpy, and they had big, long, shaggy beards and very um, rough homemade clothes, and they thought that was spiritual. Uh, and last week we mentioned the debate over masks and vaccines, and um, it was no different in the early church. They had divisions over baptism and circumcision and, and communion and meat offered in idol temples and Gentiles in church and the Sabbath and obeying Old Testament ceremonial laws. And the Apostle Paul gives us some very good advice here in Romans 14 about how to handle these secondary areas of concern in the best way possible. So the theme here is liberty and responsibility from Romans 14. And let's talk about it here. Um, I see about four different ways we can break this up. And first of all, it's very important to accept variety. Accept variety in, in disputable matters. Romans 14, 1 through 4, I just like to read from verse 1 there. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Um, some people could have the title professional belly button lint inspector. Uh, we just love to examine other people's lives and evaluate them, and, and especially about this little nitpicking area and that little nitpicking area. And Paul says, don't do that. Don't pass judgment on other people when it comes to disputable matters. Um, now, I'd never consider smoking. I don't think it's good or healthy, yet I've got a very dear Christian pastor friend. He's retired now. He's a Vietnam veteran, and he smokes to calm his nerves that were just absolutely ruined in that horrible war. And this man has a close, close relationship with God. But he smokes. Doesn't mean I have to, but Paul says here, accept him. Accept him as he is. I have friends who disagree with me on water baptism. They think that everybody should be immersed as an adult and babies shouldn't be baptized. But God wants me to accept them and enjoy fellowship with them, and I do. Uh, now, this doesn't refer to non-disputable matters like murder and stealing and gossip or salvation by grace or the things outlined in the Apostles' Creed. We must be solid on them. But uh, we also must keep the main thing, the main thing. Uh, Paul says here, this quote, to his own master he stands or falls. Uh, people have to work this out with God. God's our master. And not just do what is popular in the view of others, to please others. There is going to be a variety in the Church of Jesus Christ with liturgy, Music, food choices, clothing styles, uh, Sabbath keeping, and so many other things. And our circle of friends will be very small if we can't learn to accept variety in secondary is issues. And then the second thing Paul talks about here in verses 5 through 12 of Romans 14 is this. Settle your convictions. Settle your own convictions. Verse 5, each one must be fully convinced in his own mind. Verse 9, for we all stand before God's judgment seat. Verse 12, so then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. When I was young, I tended to practice my faith in the way that um, my family did and my, the adults around me did. I imitated them and, and, and didn't really think for myself. But over the years, I've had to kind of uh, work through many issues on my own through Bible study and prayer and just seeking the Lord and making up my own mind. And uh, on these secondary areas of dispute, I have come up with my own deep personal convictions and my conscience feels good about where I've landed on many topics. I'm sure there's many things I haven't settled yet. And, and it doesn't bother me that other people disagree with me. And I don't feel a need to uh, change them on these areas either. Uh, 
Water baptism was once a very disputable matter in my own mind. How much water, at what age, what does it mean? Uh, these were the questions I had to work out in my own mind before I went to seminary and choose where I, what direction I went. And I did. And it's settled. And, and I have peace and confidence and stability in my life because of it. And uh, people want to argue with me about water baptism. And I don't do that. I don't argue. It's, it's settled in my mind, and I, I just actually want to move on to more pressing issues than that. Uh, they say, what do you think about baptism? I think it's a good idea. And uh, move on, uh, because there's more pressing issues than that to argue about. It's very important that we work through these things in our own hearts to give ourselves stability. Ephesians 4.14 4, puts it this way, then we'll be no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Blown around, blown around by the wind. No, we can be solid if we settle our own convictions and accept variety. And then thirdly, Paul says, while you are doing these various practices, Consider others. Consider others. Romans 14, 13 through 22, I'll read some selections. Make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Do not, by your eating, destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Verse 16, do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. 17, for the kingdom of God is is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual advocation. Verse 22, so whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what? He approves. So principles, some great, great principles in this portion. Uh, there's so much here to study, but I'd like to pull out five points. The whole section is about considering others. How do my lifestyle decisions impact others positively and negatively? First of all, example. Don't do anything that hurts other people. You may feel you have the liberty to do something with your time and money, but if it causes unnecessary distress in the lives of a friend or relative or neighbor, you may want to consider how, when, and where you practice that activity. I remember hearing about a pastor in my dad's hometown who loved to dance with his wife. and uh, But dances in that town were held in some pretty unsavory places, and it just wouldn't be a good example to the young people for the pastor and his wife to be hanging around in those places. So he and his wife bought polka records and danced in the parsonage. Uh, they were trying to be considerate of others in the context of their situation. And they worked it out. And then secondly, limits. Now, some people are what I call the professionally weaker brother. They like to stifle and control our lives and steal our liberty and make us just as miserable and boring as they are. They like to imply that your example is hurting me spiritually. And Paul warns us, on the other hand, not to allow what we consider to be good to be spoken of as evil. There are some people you cannot please, no matter how hard you try. Paul had plenty of them in his ministry. He called them Judaizers, who were trying to force the Christians to adopt all these Jewish practices from the Old Testament, which they themselves couldn't even keep very well. And the Apostle Paul stood up to them and said, No, the cross of Jesus Christ is enough. Don't add anything to the finished work of Christ. So there are limits 
on how cautious we are with our lives uh, to those people who would just put us in their box just simply because they like to control us. And then focus. Focus. Try not to focus on disputable matters about eating and drinking, but focus on righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Uh, our faith is not to be a faith of do's and don'ts. That's not healthy, but, but that, that makes young people just rebel. But make it a point to emphasize on what Christ has freed us up to do as an emphasis and uh, what we're forgiven to do. Now that's the healthy approach. Uh, keep it about Jesus. Keep it about the cross. Keep it about his resurrection. Keep it about his return and coming again. Let the focus be on Christ and not on the law. And then fourthly, peace. The mature Christian life leads to peace and not to strife. Uh, some people bring strife into a room and other people bring peace. Uh, most of us, it's probably a mix. But, you know, if you feel that your expression of the Christian faith is bringing strife into situations, um, it's best to go home and think about it. Uh, we should generally be bringing peace wherever we go. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now, there's exceptions to that. I mean, some people react to us, but we should be the ones bringing peace. And then accountability. Paul says here, whatever you do, it is between you and God. The old saying puts it well. You, can't, you can please all the people some of the time, and some of the people all of the time. But you can't please all the people all the time. I've noticed that people pleasers are always on the edge of being burnt out. People with sound convictions are at rest no matter what people think about them. They care more about what God thinks than what other people think. Jesus said, come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Accountability to God. So that's considering others. And then finally, as we consider uh, liberty and responsibilities, uh, Paul says here uh, in his own words, I am summarizing it with this phrase, stick to your guns. Stick to your guns. Romans 14, 23. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. Now these gray areas are called adiaphora. Adiaphora, that's a word that comes from the Greek etymology meaning no difference. It makes no difference to God where we land on these issues. They're adiaphora, but it makes difference to people. Um, here's the topic in this passage that he uses to illustrate it as meat sacrifice to idols. It's just meat. Idols aren't real. They're just wooden stone. The meat is meat, no matter uh, the context of how and when and where uh, you eat it. That's what's significant. It, it makes no difference for salvation, Paul says, if you eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols or don't eat it. But what makes the difference is faith. Now, if you have faith in that idol and think that there's some power in that meat, don't eat it, he says. Don't eat it. But if you know that the idol's nothing, and that the creator of God in heaven is over all, and that the ritual spoken over that meat by the pagan priest is meaningless, then eat it. And then no matter what anybody says, stick to your guns. Uh, you'll be able to stick to your guns, number one, if you accept variety, if you want people to give you space and freedom, give them the same space and freedom that you want to have. We're not going to agree on everything. We are human, and we have different preferences. Secondly, settle your convictions. You'll be able to stick to your guns if you settle your convictions and take time 
to seek God in His Word and prayer and become convinced with solid personal convictions and not worry about what other people will think about you. Uh, if you hold a conviction without foundation in the Word of God, you'll vacillate. And that will open the door to people trying to control you. Uh, and it will cause you a lot of stress because if you vacillate, uh, the controllers will come at you and they'll try to control you. They can sense you're weak. And then thirdly, consider others. If we practice our personal liberty in a humble way, considering its effect on other people and not in their face, you know, uh, then others will generally respect us even if we don't agree with them. Uh, my friend who smokes, he doesn't blow smoke in my face, but when his nerves get jangled, a Christian man, he goes off by himself and, and smokes because that's just the way it's been since he was in the war. Um, we must be careful not to let our faith in Christ become another uh, Old Testament Jewish religion of earning God's favor through strict obedience to the law. The law is our tutor to bring us to Christ and to the cross and to freedom. When we meet the Savior and see him innocently dying on the cross in our place, this should result in faith and righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Spirit uh, and not stress and strife and do's and don'ts. The hallmark of true mature Christianity is joy and peace and a life of loving kindness toward others. It's a beautiful thing to know Jesus personally. In closing, I'd like to quote St. Augustine. Uh, he has a quote that I think sums it up so well. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, using the more modern word, love. Amen and amen. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I encourage you to go to our website, mnvalleychurch.org, to see the opportunities and activities that are coming as our fall progresses and things start opening up more and more. Glad to have you here live or on some of our Zoom Bible studies and other things like that. Uh, Drive-in services are going to end at the end of September, so uh, we got a couple more Saturday nights to come in. And if you got a classic car, we'd especially love to see that. And uh, so that's 6 p.m. on Saturday nights, followed by hot dogs and a bonfire. Uh, now please receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Thank you for worshiping with us today. For more information or to contact us, please visit us on the web at mnvalleychurch.org or find us on Facebook at Minnesota Valley Church.